Hi, I'm going to do a certain chapter from my book, This Best Being, as an audio um, for this week. And it's interesting how it came to me uh, that I would do this this week, because two weeks ago I did a PSA on fear called What is Fear? Arguing that it's, except for instinctive fear, which is very necessary, it's mental. It comes from the outside, something that we've heard, an idea that we've had that we then build up in our imagination to be one thing or another. And But there is a deeper way of seeing fear, of working with fear, and it's interesting that this chapter, I opened the book, which chapter do I want? And it's a chapter that has a very innocuous title called Interlude, but actually it really is what I would now call What is Fear? Part 2, Fear and Its Fascination. Okay, so now uh, the audio will begin of this particular chapter uh, called <clears throat> Interlude, Late June. I underwent my initial grieving process with an end point in mind. June 5th, Jeff's memorial in Jackson, Wyoming, five months and one day from the day he died. I didn't realize it then, but this period was a time capsule, sealed, with me inside it. I gave little attention to what lay beyond, so it should come as no surprise that when my plane from Jackson touched down in Indiana, the capsule opened to reveal what I can only call existential dread. Looking back, I now see dread, with a capital D, as the atmosphere attending the sudden, shocked sensation that I was alone, traveling unimpeded and unnoticed in a vast and indifferent universe. The experience felt crushing. It reminds me of a student from back east, we called it then, who came to Idaho for the summer to move pipe in the flat, featureless wheat and potato fields near my hometown. The immense steel-blue bowl sky oppressed and terrified him. Within a few weeks, he rushed back to the intimate, human-scaled hills and dales of New England. Walking through the crowded airport, immersed in a silence so profound that I could hear my own breathing, I knew how that student felt. Where was I going? What was the goal? How could I even tell in what direction I was heading? And worse, who cares? What does it matter, given such immensity? I was dimly aware of others bustling around me, but they seemed very far off, so inconsequential as to be nearly transparent. There was just me, just these lungs, filling space with monotonous, mechanical whooshing. My beloved companion had died, and I had drifted dreamily through five delicious and excruciating months, during which I hardly ever felt alone. I wasn't alone. I had been living in Jeff's generous and expansive aura. My initial grieving had to do with accepting, on all levels, on especially the visceral level, Jeff's altered status. And I was fascinated the whole time by the palpable resonance between us, the interdimensional pathways we seemed to be forging. I was accustomed to the subtle, ongoing presence of Jeff's disincarnate self. Enveloped in his love, I felt real, sure of myself, clear. His illumination shone through my world, lending it color and weight and value. But now the memorial was over. It was time to move on. On the return flight, I had meditated on the shift I needed to make. Admitting that I felt scared and unsure, I tried to convince myself to look forward. But no matter how I tried to prepare, It seems that my mind was not capable of easing the way into my new reality, for suddenly, upon landing in Indianapolis, it was as if I had fallen from earth into space. The sudden descent felt vertiginous, 
and the disconnect almost as intense as that first night when I had hovered stiff as a board suspended between heaven and earth. Act one was over. Shock again announced Act Two, and it echoed the first beginning in that its chief defining feature was nothingness. Once again, I found myself staring from behind closed lids into the void. Two weeks later, I grow accustomed to his routine absence, though punctuated with periodic check-ins. It's as if I'm convalescent, and Jeff the doctor who pops in to check vital signs and monitor recovery. But he doesn't enter the room anymore. He just peeks in the door, and he seems in a hurry to move on. My soul wants to be generous and gracious and say, Be well, my friend. Have a wonderful life. But my mind and body are not quite that far along. I have more grieving to do. One night, recently... I woke up feeling a hand upon my heart, just as if a physical person were present, with open hand lightly resting on my chest. Was this Jeff? A few months ago, I would have known it was he. Now I don't, and the gesture itself, though comforting, felt impersonal. Yet, if I still need to grieve, why do I feel so alive? For if those first five months were yin, flowing and mysterious. Then this second act feels decidedly yang, sharply active. Energy quickens, stirs inside. The fire hose spreads to include not just writing, but living. The airport dread felt strong, but it was fleeting. I had a taste of what might come, or perhaps not, For I feel so energized that already I have trouble invoking that disorienting sense of falling through space that had held me during the hour-long shuttle from Indianapolis to Bloomington. In fact, I moved like a robot, deep in the dark of this strange malaise, until the moment when my key turned the lock on the door. Greeting me inside were not only my two cats, but a chipmunk, a mouse, a bird, and the sweet stink of what I discovered three days later was a long dead bird, all brought in through the kitty door. Dread dropped me with a thunk, squarely into the mundane. I had things to do immediately. I had re-entered the structure built up over a lifetime to tame the vastness into a tiny portion that I have learned to call my own. Those initial months were also occupied with writing, my way of shaping and comprehending grief. Another structure, this one just large enough to map the initial feeling process that his death set in motion. I imagine that I will stop this writing soon, around the sixth month anniversary of his death. So again, what then? Will dread resurface? And if so, will I find the courage to consciously suffer that ill wind? Or will I scurry to bury panic in the minutia of daily life? I find it interesting that dread, a subtle, almost metaphysical feeling, came on so strong that it paralyzed thought and destroyed desire. Maybe dread shouldn't be classified as a feeling, for when present, it seems so all-encompassing as to embody an alternate reality. In any case, I suspect that dread lives on the other side of an invisible wall kept in place by daily routines and the projective force of plans and projects. Our culture tries to keep us up. From childhood on, we're taught to build internal walls against any but happy feelings, as in, I'm okay, you're okay, and have a nice day. We are terrified of dropping into that netherworld where our conscious minds are useless and feelings of all kinds overwhelm us. What we label as depression may signify a condition where we are dimly aware of the internal wall we unconsciously constructed to shield ourselves from the clamor of compressed, and therefore explosive, 
feelings. A wall that feels thick, solid, unmoving, crushing. In fact, it doesn't feel like a wall at all, but like what we imagine is, or maybe, reality. The finality of our own personal death. Just the thought of death paralyzes us with fear. We feel suffocated, as if we are lying in a tomb already dead and rotting. Due to both cultural conditioning and our own fear of overwhelm, of course we want to avoid that particular awareness. So we pop Paxil or Xanax or Prozac or Zoloft. I've heard that most therapists are themselves on antidepressants. Or we drink or smoke or eat or shop or make money or buy a bigger car or house or entertain or otherwise distract ourselves from what we fear is not there. Dread. The endless, dizzying, nauseating fall into a bottomless abyss. I sense most of us have experienced dread at least once, perhaps in a rare moment when, temporarily marooned, we suddenly and inexplicably dropped into the yawning space between carefully drawn lines. And yet I sense that if we dare to face dread, even momentarily, or for a few hours or days, we might learn that we don't fall off the world after all, at least, that has been my experience. As I learned to face and embrace dread and other difficult psychological states, pharmaceutical cures for depression feel both inappropriate and unnecessary, in fact, downright pernicious, in that they separate me from my own depths. I seek to engage the life of the soul and its evolutionary journey. I seek to continually return to and rebirth the vitality of my original nature. And I have a hunch that only as I embrace the troughs of despair will I also climb the peaks where joy resides. If you have experienced depression, then you might argue that my experience of dread was so short as to not qualify as depression. But believe me, I have been there. In my early 20s as a young wife, mother, and graduate student, I moved like a robot, literally bored stiff, so numb that there were times when I would suddenly, inexplicably, kiss my arm or pinch it just to make sure I was alive. Those years crawled by interminably despite an infernal busyness that covered an overwhelming, suffocating, barely suppressed panic that mocked my every effort. So when dread greeted me in the Indianapolis airport on June 12th, it came as a sharp, short reminder of my own past. That dread arrived with such suddenness and in high contrast to the near supernatural sense of security that I had enjoyed since Jeff's death made the shock of it all the more profound. On a more hopeful note, just as I have experienced the extremes of either suffocating solidity and or nauseating emptiness within the phenomenon I call dread, this supremely negative psychological condition so have I, on rare occasions, been plunged into a state of awareness opposite to the entire phenomenon of dread itself. I first tapped into this state one summer morning as a six-year-old. I was walking with my doll to my friend Edwina's house, as usual, to play. What I remember is the sun's light and warmth, the green grass and trees, the deep blue sky, the slightly moving air. All this I had been aware of before, many times, but on this particular morning, somehow that awareness opened a door. All of a sudden, while walking along as usual, I dropped into another dimension, what I have since named abiding presence. The ceaseless activity of the world and the constant churning of my thoughts all stopped. 
in their stead opened a timeless, spacious silence, holding everything in its embrace as one. If I may put that childhood experience in the context of the early history of Western philosophy, it appears that I had stumbled into the being of Parmenides and discovered that it contains all of the becoming of Heraclitus, every single drop of that famous river we can't step into twice. It's interesting that Parmenides has not lived on in our cultural imagination as has Heraclitus. We view the ever-changing river of Heraclitus as a meditation on impermanence. His philosophy teaches us to let go of attachment to any particular experience or person or thing or plan or role or education or status, etc. Heraclitus serves as a welcome counterbalance to the still metastasizing busyness and materialism of Western culture, where getting and having remain the measure of success. However, when I meditate on the being of Parmenides as well, I find it easier to let go of attachments, since while dwelling within the abiding presence, my awareness feels at one with not just my own experiences, but with the entire blooming world. For at least one bright and shining moment, I do sense the miracle. All of creation is alive. The universe is shot through with awareness. In other words, I need not fear impermanence, since to dwell within being is to float in an ocean of endless abundance. That first otherworldly experience of an all-pervasive luminous presence remains as a tantalizing gift that shifted me momentarily into what I have since learned to recognize as the now. But of course, back then I couldn't hold it. In fact, while the experience startled and enticed, it also scared me. It felt so far outside the range of the normal that I had no words for it. And even now, over half a century later, I have trouble describing this and other ineffable states. Indeed, I'm surprised that I can recall the experience since for me, language tends to encode memory. It's interesting that my early flash into oneness surfaces now, because I would say that my life during those first precious months after Jeff's death, when I felt embraced in love, was exactly that. I had landed in the abiding presence, where being and becoming fuse into one. So then, five months later, the landing at the airport, the fall from grace. These two dimensions, dread and the abiding presence, is one the underbelly of the other? My friend Claudia claims that my experience of love cushioned me from the eventual fall into the abyss that was bound to come next. That, of course, the dream world couldn't last, for we encounter dread as a natural part of the grieving process. I don't want to believe her. I want to think I can just fall into the love that so graciously accompanied his departure, then endure a mere flash of the abyss, making me ever more grateful for the love, and then, finally, wake up again to normal life, washing my hands of grief. As in, there. That's done. Now get on with it. In this desire, I am thoroughly a product of my culture, wanting to get on with my business, my busyness as soon as possible. But I suspect Claudia knows what she's talking about. Over the nearly two decades of our friendship, this unusual woman has impressed me as the deepest psychological thinker I have ever known. In fact, were it not for her influence, I might not be attending to or valuing this grief as a gift from the unconscious that subtly and continuously alters me as bit by bit it releases memories and their feelings to the surface. I marvel at how in the grieving process the unconscious seems to give me exactly what I can handle at the time, no more and no less. Difficult memories surface only when I'm ready for them, so that the more difficult the memory, the longer it takes to emerge. 
I am in awe of the natural wisdom of this seemingly regulated opening to the remembered past and how it engenders a deep inner security. Astonished that my own unconscious is so on my side. Claudia's life path seems to be to restore value, both individually and culturally, to the life of feelings stored in the unconscious. When I first met her nearly two decades ago, I was split off from my feelings altogether. For the first few years, with unfailing empathy and patience, she nudged me to extract feeling from memory. This process invariably released ever deeper memories and the feelings lodged in them for review. In this way, I learned to plunge into the depths and to process old stuck emotions that had crippled me and prevented further unfoldment of my original nature. Though Claudia and I live at a great distance, we still periodically work with each other's stuff in long phone conversations. She helps me process my inner life. I help her realize how she's perceived by the outer world. After all these years under Claudia's tutelage, such deep internal work is almost, but not quite, natural for me, so that since Jeff's death, I've been able to process grief, for the most part, on my own. An exception is this characterization of dread and presence, which I decided needed the Claudia treatment. Here is her response. She thinks I've given dread too big a role to play that dread is not on a par with being the abiding presence, but merely a reaction to not having plans, a temporary condition. But though I eventually find that she's usually right, I must stay with my own experience in order to faithfully record what is true for me now. For me now, phenomenologically, dread and being are both states of awareness approximately equal in magnitude. Dread and the abiding presence as twins, even Siamese twins, joined at the head, joined in my head, which is which? They seem so much alike. Both lurk or reside beneath the surface of daily life, and both seem to create and pervade space. Both feel timeless and all-pervasive, yet I sense them as opposites. In one, I feel connected to everything, and all's right with the world, and the other only I exist, an infinitesimal dot sucked into a black hole. I have a hunch that which one I experience depends on my ego state at the time. In early childhood, my ego was not yet fully formed, the boundary between me and the larger presence more like a membrane than a wall, permeable. Over the years, as I grew up, my ego strengthened to focus intent on plans and projects. Then, at 60 years of age, the intense shock of discovering my husband's dead body on the bed popped me right through the wall, or it did for a while. And on the other side of the wall was love. I was the child again, bathed in the warm waters of the universal womb, which, however, ended five months later, after Jeff's memorial. As in Plato's famous myth, the seeker, having seen the sun, must return to the darkness of the cave. So on my return to Indiana from Jeff's memorial, I had to re-enter this life on this earth and was stunned to find myself utterly disoriented, valuing nothing over anything else, with no interest in plans and projects. That scared me, took my breath away. No longer a child whose ego was just forming, easily penetrated, I was adult. I identified with my ego and could sense nothing else, just me, me alone, adrift in endless, suffocating space. I'm just now reminded of another time when I popped through the wall. Why do I remember this now? What is the nature of the thread I am following here? Yet I must follow it, else I ignore the subtly timed inner releasing of yet another memory that apparently bears on this discussion. Why am I moved to continue to explore these rare and contrasting states of holistic awareness? I'm not sure. 
And if it is all too much for you, dear reader, then please simply skip to the next chapter. For in this particular chapter, I do want to follow certain cues in the form of memories as they enter my mind. I intend to trail memory down. This next just surfaced memory also involves a shocking change in the physical that popped me through the wall. That time, it was not a radical shift in my husband's relationship to his body that sheared me from the ordinary, but a radical shift in my own body, an apparently mortal illness. I was 26 years old and for seven days had been lying feverish in Massachusetts General Hospital, my belly swollen with general abdominal peritonitis for which I had been given one by one over 30 intravenous antibiotics, all they had at the time. On the eighth morning, when the doctor came in, he seemed discouraged. He checked my chart, then looked up, muttering, I don't know what else to do for you. I looked up, focused on his face. Am I going to die? He seemed startled, even embarrassed. Then he shrugged his shoulders and hastily exited the room. Imagine his discomfort. This was decades before Kubler-Ross, when a previously shy and introverted, extremely ill young woman dared to mention her own death. It was then that I made the single most important decision of my entire life. I chose to live rather than die. In doing so, I made a deliberate conscious decision to follow my own nature wherever it may lead, intuitively knowing that this decision would alter my course forever. This decision was not one that I'd known for a long time I needed to make, nor did it answer a rational question to which I had applied logic and the weighing of evidence. Regardless, illness finally pushed me over its edge. All of a sudden, I heard a deep, booming, internal voice. The voice commanded, clear as day, live or die. It's your choice. Had this voice spoken to me when I was well and immersed in my usual busyness, I would have looked around to see who said that, and failing to find anyone would have been terrified and wondered if I was crazy. But I was mortally ill, in an extreme situation, up against the wall, so to speak. Did God speak to me during that decisive moment, or did I channel a spiritual guide? Or did my body's fever ignite an internal spiritual fire that suddenly popped through the wall as a voice into awareness? Whatever the source of the voice, the power of its command galvanized my entire body-mind unto an entirely new course. In that one moment, I knew instantly and intuitively that I would live, and that in order to live I must follow my own nature— However, I had no idea what my own nature was. Indeed, I had not before applied the term nature to individual persons, nor did I, of course, know what it meant to follow my nature. Something through me or in me made that decision, something that knew much more than I did, something that I would now associate somehow with soul. Needless to say, within 24 hours, my belly had flattened and my fever had disappeared. My spontaneous remission surprised the doctors and affirmed the course I had just embarked upon. That morning, when I looked in a mirror, I was stunned to notice that the planes of my face had been rearranged. I soon began to discover what following my nature meant. Just as a child learns the word hot when she touches a hot stove, in fact, hot was my first word as a toddler, So I began to learn from mistakes what was too hot to handle, what not. From the moment of my wake-up call in the hospital, I committed to learning primarily from personal experience rather than from culture, tradition, books, other people's experiences codified into rules, and it was not exactly fun. In fact, deliberately setting out to learn from my own mistakes was, and sometimes still is, a messy, confusing and often painful business. Indeed, early on in this new life, sometimes my adventures were downright terrifying, full of drama and trauma, and not just for myself. 
My heart still aches to recall what I put my loved ones through as, flailing blindly, I hunted down the scent of my own truth. For I knew intuitively that in order to follow my nature, I had to move with what fascinated me, moment by moment, no matter how strange it might seem to others or even to myself. If it truly fascinated me, it was mine to do. I was running my whole life as if it was an experiment, as in, let's see what will happen if I do this. Ouch! Of course, we all learn from our mistakes. This is the way we continually correct our courses. It's like sailing a boat. If we want to go in a certain direction, we need to sense the direction of the wind and then tack back and forth, always approximating, never quite true to the direction set. What made my case unusual was that, like a toddler, but in full adulthood, I had deliberately chosen to learn from mistakes as my primary method of discovery about both how, how I and the world worked. After a few years, I finally did pause to catch my breath, lick my wounds, and take stock. On the one hand, I knew that I had to keep going, that the only other choice was death, or depression, death in life. I had to continue to follow the current of my own life, no matter where it led, always assuming that whatever attracted me most was the next signpost along the way of my singular path. Yet I was also highly aware of my own fear. In my nighttime dreams, I walked unnoticed and unknown through vast and unfamiliar landscapes. In waking life, I was flying in the face of tradition, of culture, of especially any residual guilt for my actions. By this time, I had identified guilt as our culture's glue holding its members in place. At this juncture, to help me stay the course and remain true to myself, I adopted a personal motto. It was this, whatever I'm both fascinated by and afraid of, that is what I must do. And in order to minimize pain, either to myself or others, I added a corollary. Try not to make the same mistake twice, i.e. truly learn from each experience. You can rest assured that at no time, not even at the beginning of my quest, did I contemplate acting deliberately on murderous or otherwise harmful impulses. My intent was to disenculturate, not dehumanize myself. Like Rousseau and Emerson and others in a long romantic tradition, I enjoy a gut sense that human beings, when allowed their natural development, are inherently good. I am happy to report that after about 14 years, the drama did begin to subside. My mistakes created a body of knowledge that I could draw upon in reflection. I began to sift through significant memories, both to recognize how actions create consequences and, thank you, Claudia, to recognize and honor the feelings buried in those memories. As a natural result of this long and intensive reflective process, I began to have compassion for my own struggle and to commit myself to healing certain relationships, especially those with my parents and my own children. My learning process grew more efficient and refined. I didn't have to repeat myself so much, at least not in small ways, for as I grew older, I began to gain more of a bird's eye view and discovered that some repetitions involve large patterns that play themselves out over a span of years, even decades. And I began to see how they all combine to form the larger trajectory of my life. Thus, as I grew older, my discoveries about myself grew richer, deeper, and more complex. Each time I recognized a pattern that played itself out over a long time span, I felt tremendously excited. What a eureka moment! For I knew I had a chance to release the pattern once detected. Of course, it would take time and effort to do so, since locked in any pattern was a compressed, complex knot of feelings that required much patience and subtlety to discern, unravel, re-experience, and finally, release. Each release of feelings and the pattern that had boxed them freed me to live more in the moment. In this way, my world gradually became more and more interesting. Like a curious child, 
I felt thrilled to be alive. As larger and larger patterns started to clear up and out, I began to pay attention to what was happening while it was happening, rather than later, when it was too late and I had created yet another hurtful mess which involved not only myself but other people. In other words, I began to detach myself from total identification with my own ego to lighten up and develop a sense of humor. And I was beginning to create a fair witness to my experiences. This light of awareness, at first rare and intermittent, has grown to become, as I begin my seventh decade, a near constant steady illumination, a beacon that lights the way out of whatever dark tunnel I encounter, including the death of my beloved husband. Lest you think that I was graced with courage or luck to have attempted such an extreme course and yet emerge relatively unscathed, please realize that many times during those early years, in order to drum up my nerve, I would repeat my motto endlessly like a mantra. This fascinates me. This is what I'm afraid of. This I must do. It had worked so far. I was counting on it working again, and it always did. I was learning much more by focusing on what both fascinated and frightened me than I would have learned had I stuck with the tried and true. My life has been one long, continuous opening. Which brings me to the present. Now, nearly four decades later, at 60, I stand at yet another crossroad. In order to follow my nature through the grieving process over my husband's death, I must repeat the current variation on my personal mantra, developed in order to process grief. Whatever feeling threatens to overwhelm me, that is what I must allow. Just now, the feeling that overwhelms me is confusion. I sense that I do not comprehend much of what I'm trying to discuss here, that I'm a fool if I think I do, and that years later, maybe even two weeks from now, I will want to erase this entire discussion as hopelessly muddled. I could call my muddle a mutant form of dread, for as usual, being a dramatic person, I leap from part to whole. I don't understand anything. Once again, the bottom falls out and I tumble through the void. So, dread. Yes, I must admit, it is the abyss itself which fascinates and always has. Indeed, I have hiked in mountains all my life and have yet to meet a cliff face that I haven't been tempted to step off, thinking maybe I could fly. So, dread. Dread could be the monster blocking the shining path ahead. I want to learn to become accustomed to dread, to invite dread in, to relish how it clears the decks, its delighted dance with impermanence. Dread may be one gate into the mystery, yet I sense that, given my nature, I will never dwell within dread at length, at least not consciously, not with awareness. For as a Sagittarian, I have been gifted from birth with an abundance of fiery energy and am temperamentally an eternal or foolish optimist. It is difficult for me to even get to the place where my plans and projects do not fill me with excitement as I rise to their challenge. But what about those moments when expectations come to naught and the bottom drops out. Is dread liable to steal in? Once again, I may be caught in the horror of impermanence, which, as before, I must resolve to face and fully embrace. And if I am fortunate, perhaps in time I will, without having to go through dread, be gifted with the capacity, or better, through daily meditative practices, I will actually develop the skill to shift at will into the mysterious abiding presence, that all-encompassing seamless love that Jeff and my entire community called upon in the early stages of my grief to ease my way forward without him.